And we got a few questions that came in by text during the break. So I think we'll start with these and then see um, if there's other questions that surface from, uh, from folks as we go through. So an interesting question that, that came up right off the bat um, during the break through the text was um, if either of you can sort of speak about doing business modeling in a way that um, is not too prescriptive frankly, and that is not too rigid, but that actually allows an organization to maintain some adaptive capacity. Um, and, and there was a concern that um, folks might end up doing this deep, intentional, rigorous work and then kind of get locked in, quote unquote. Um, so you know, I think you both sort of had earlier on talked about iteration, uh, but maybe if you can, can give us a little bit more background on, on your thinking around those questions. I think. Um I th first of all, I think that's an, a great question, um, and it's it's great to sort of have a plan and, and have a direction. But things also happen along the way that you know plans don't always play out as we think they're going to play out. And so one strategy is to have some different scenarios as part of a plan, so that you are able to um, to think about okay, well here's here's the direction we're heading in. We're trying to get more government funding. Um, you know, we're driving to a certain funding mix, but along the way, well, what if this legislation doesn't come through? Then, then what do we do? What does that look like? Um, so you can have some scenarios that help you think about what the possible futures could be. And I think that's particularly helpful. Um, it has been, I think, helpful through the economic downturn, but even looking at, I think, as some organizations, and it feels like things are starting to pick up a bit, um, even think about, well, what does the future look like? Uh, are we going to be kind of in a slow growth mode, or are there actually going to be some bigger opportunities out there? Um, so how do we plan for that? So I, I would say that's um, you know, one thing to, to keep in mind to give yourself some flexibility. I think also um, you know, there's a lot of um, discussion about sort of how long should the plan be, you know, three years, five years, two years, four years. Uh, I think just given the volatility and, and given how organizations are evolving, I would I would say you know probably three years is enough. I mean, when you get much beyond that, you're kind of trying to predict the future, and it's a little bit hard to do that. Um, and so, yeah, I would suggest you know something in, in that range, but perhaps having a also a checkpoint along the way to say, okay, are we diverging from this? If so, why? What's driving that? And then what does that say about the direction we? So I always think of a plan as more of a living document and something that kind of guides the direction as opposed to something that locks you in. But I also appreciate, um, you know, personally, just given my personality, I appreciate having a plan and, you know, having a sense of, okay, here's what we're trying to do. Our organization is aligned around this and, you know, we're, we're trying to move in this direction. I think there's some great uses for it. Um, but for folks who also are more, want to be more open to opportunities and, uh, not miss out on great opportunities, I can also understand how that can feel constraining. So build in some scenarios, build in some checkpoints, and give yourself some space. So the, the one cautionary piece that I would that I would say to that around, definitely you want to have some, some mitigation and, and risk mitigation and having some scenarios, but I will, I will channel the, the great philosopher and poet Mike Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> Who, who once said, everybody has a plan until they get hit. <laughs> and so as you, as you develop these plans and you bring them out and you begin to, to realize what it is uh, that you're trying to accomplish, it's not going to go all smooth in the way that you're thinking about it um, because it, is, it has just had contact with the enemy. But you have to keep the end game in mind. And so that, that discipline piece is not, in, not swinging from the actual plan of, like for us, is 80-20, but how you get there may be very different than how you, the, the tactical ways to do that may be very different once you get out into the reality. And I use an example of coming here today. I live in far Contra Costa County. I mapped out my route last night, and I love the whole little Google thing, and it tells you how long you got. You take this route. Well, the route that I took this morning that I started on wasn't the route that I mapped out at last night. And then even in that route, I had to take another detour. But I still ended up here. I didn't end up down at the other center in San Jose. <laughs> and, so the, and, and so that's what I think you have to keep your end game. Where is it that you're trying to go? And make sure that your tactics 
that, that you can diversify your tactics, but your end game has to be your end game. And that has to be, and it's gonna take disciplined thought to actually get you there. Excellent. Um, had a question that sort of continuing to, to, to get down into the nitty gritty, um, really about determining the true cost of programs. I think people heard that message and, and the depth um, of analysis that needs to be done there. But um, a question really around <coughs> this idea of um, getting clear about how individual staff are using their time. Um, given that we know in most nonprofit organizations that labor is the overwhelming majority of the expense side. Um, and so to really be able to pull apart, it sounded like with the level of detail that you both sort of encouraged, um, if there's specific thoughts or, or tactics or methodologies that you'd recommend for being able to really get clear about sort of that allocation of, of labor. You know, we, um, as we've gone through our financial model, we actually do time studies. And we ask people to actually help us understand how they're spending their time. Um, if I have a senior manager and they're coming back to me and their pie chart equals 40 hours, that's probably not right. Uh, because I know they're spending more time than 40 hours doing it. So that you can really begin to understand what, what people are spending their time on. Um, but you also have to think about the ancillary people as well. And if you, I think, thinking about events, because a lot of people have events, um, and understanding the, the true cost of an event, and we can use the event today. You know, and what is the true cost of the event? You know how much the food costs, you know how much the building, if you had to rent it, and all of that costs. Like, you know how much those things cost. And when we do events, we usually say, hey, we raised this amount of money, and we spent this amount of money, and here's our net. But someone had to organize the event. How much time did they actually spend doing that? For this event, Alexa and Kenji and Mara drove down to, drove down to Oakland. Uh, the staff drove down to Oakland to meet with us and to prep us and make sure that we're there. There are tons of emails that fly back and forth. That took time. And so to truly understand the true cost of this event, you really have to understand how much time did it really take based on, a, based on what those people are making per hour to understand if you came in at your, your event piece. You know, uh, another example I give is, you know, some of us have executive assistants and they work on the travel. I can, I, uh, I had one who would have me having five hour layovers in Chicago because it was $50 cheaper. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so you got me out in Midway for five hours <laughs> for $50. I have no internet connection. So I'm just stuck there for five hours. It's actually costing us more then at $50, did it just get me on the straight through? <laughs> and so I think those are a couple of examples of just really going through and understanding what is it actually costing you and asking your people to do those time studies. One of the things that we've been able to do, especially for our line staff, is ask them to do the time studies and then observe the time. So we actually do ride-alongs. We, we shadow people for a week so that my evaluators, my internal evaluators, can actually determine how much time they're spending. They haven't gotten around to shadowing me yet, uh, but I will. Uh, I look forward to that actually coming, so I can see how I'm really spending my time versus how I think I'm spending it. Yeah, I think. I mean, it's it's time studies, picking a representative period of time, and having people track their time. And you can do it in a kind of quick and dirty way, you know, you can, you can put as much effort into it as you, as you want. You can have detailed spreadsheets. I think you have to figure out kind of what's going to give you a baseline of information that's going to be useful depending on, you know, what your starting point is. I know for me, one of the things I loved about leaving management consulting was I didn't have to track, you know, every project and all my hours and kind of where it was all going. And recently at the foundation, we did a time study, and I was like, oh, God, I have this spreadsheet, and I have to fill in all these things. But you know, it was actually really helpful for us to get a better sense of where some of us were spending our time and what it was really taking to deliver the impact that you know, we're trying to deliver. So um, I know it's a, it, it can be a pain, um, and people you know, can find it not that exciting. But I think it's also really important to then take the information that you get out of it and share it back with folks so that everybody can see, OK, this information was actually helpful, or here's what we're learning from it. Great. Um, another interesting question here about as folks move through building a business model, and I think to Sam's point, that really drives sort of the core sustainability, um, there was also a question about the fact that 
there are sometimes things that are just very difficult to fundraise for anyway. Um, and, and some things around you know, research um, and development or evaluation capacity, to things around, um, in some cases for organizations, uh, uh, equipment or some of those capital expenses, this, the things that are either intermittent or that are really hard to kind of directly tag and associate to um, the core of what you're gonna ask a funder to pay for in terms of delivery of service. I was wondering if either of you had thoughts about um, making sure that the model can incorporate stuff that's otherwise kind of hard to capture. So, I mean, one of my frustrations is the lack of funding available, particularly on a more local level, for evaluation um, and performance management. Um, I know that's something that we invest in for the organizations that we're working with, um, but there are not enough vendors that are doing that work, and I think it's so critical to be able to be able to tell you know stories about the impact that you're having, to be able to learn and improve what you're doing. Um, so, you know. I'm not, yeah, I'm not gonna pretend like, oh, I hear these five funders everyone should go to. Um, but I think that the more um, nonprofits are raising that and the more funders are talking about it, my hope is that we can actually get more funders that are, are putting that money out there because um, there's a lot of talk about funding what works, but you know, people really need to put the money behind that. Um, and I feel like we're trying to take a, a position and do that, um, and you know, I hope that other organizations do as well. No, I, I, I think it really does go back to your funding model, your impact, and what your priorities are. And what I mean by that is if you take our 80-20 model, we understand that the government reimbursement that we get per kid served really needs to take care of all of the, all of the services that we're actually giving a young person. Therefore, if you're spending your unrestricted dollars, depending on your model, but if you're spending your unrestricted dollars, dollars that you can use anywhere to subsidize programs, that's perhaps a bad use of money. I'm just, I'm just putting it out there. And so I think you have to go back and you have to really, after you take a look at what that funding mix is, what are your priorities within that? What are the priorities within that funding, within that funding mix? And what have you carved out that you know, your, your government dollars or your earned income is gonna, is, is gonna pay for, what is it that your, that your foundation dollars are gonna go pay for, where is it that you're gonna fundraise money at? Um, I worked at organizations and I go in and I talk to the development director and I say, what's the strategy? She said, oh, we're gonna throw whatever we can up against the wall and whatever sticks, sticks. <laughs> and so you have to be more disciplined around, here's where we're trying to raise money and here are the reasons why we're trying to raise, uh, and here's where we're trying to raise money. And depending on where uh, research and development and, uh, and evaluation rank at, then that's where you actually put it at into your, you put it at into your pie. Uh, because no, there isn't a lot of people out there who are going to pay for, you know, you need a new copy or you need, a, or you need to rehab a building. Um, we, we had to do a whole administrative building uh, in Oakland and everyone loves the building but nobody actually paid for it. We had to use our own reserves and our own uh, individual fundraisers because nobody wants to build you an office space. <laughs> that, that's not very compelling. But you need it to work with. I think part of what Sam is illustrating too is going back to the point about intentionality and making choices. And you know, I remember conversations that we had many years ago about, well I could take this money and I could use it on program or I could take this money and I could you know put it towards evaluation planning and you know you made choices about you know given the priorities of your organization and the kind of impact you wanted to have down the road about taking some of that money and putting it more towards evaluation um, you know obviously when you get to you know big RCT type evaluations you know you're looking at you know millions of dollars so you know that it's it's not that easy to just make that choice on that level but I think you know I, I can think back to several years ago and, and having that conversation. Um, and, you know, again, it was driven by the priorities that you had and, you know, how, where you thought it was a better use of spending your unrestricted money. Yeah, and I'd say go back. There's an article that we suggested around what is your end game? Um, and where you put your priorities will really be determined by what is your end game? What is it that you're trying to do? Are you trying to be an organization that replicates? Are you trying to be an organization that changes government policy? Are you trying to be an organization that is an innovator? And depending on what your end game is, that will go back and determine 
your priorities and actually where you put your dollars at and what you raise your money for. And one other thing, going back to the capital question, sorry. Um, so from some of the organizations I've worked with, um, it, it seems like capital um, can actually be quite appealing to individuals, um, buildings, et cetera, and naming opportunities. And I mean, you still have to find those donors, but it seems like there's more of a, a fit there. Um, some foundations obviously do that um, type of funding, but um, I think there, again, it's sort of thinking about what is the constituency that you're gonna go after um, and what do they want, and you know how can you offer that? I have a grantee right now that's building a, a center in Watts um, down in LA, and um, they have a, a very exciting architect doing it. It's not public yet, but um, they have people kind of banging down the door, like we want to get our name on that building. Um, so you know, it m maybe it's not about the foundations in that situation. Um, you know, it's it's going to be more about individuals. Great. A couple of um, really specific in, uh, questions around, and maybe Sam can take this one uh, quickly, just about sort of who on your team has been involved um, in the, the work to do sort of business model development. Um, so we believe in putting together um, what we call interdisciplinary teams. And so it, it, it can't just be led by your finance people. Your, your finance people, they are the, they're the people who are going to be involved. They're going to help you do the analysis, and I want to, and I also want to be clear: is it took me. Everyone kept telling me I needed a CFO, and I really couldn't understand what a CFO did from what a controller did, and so it took me six months of talking to people and trying to really, before I made a hire, what is it that these two people do? You know, you got a controller, he does finance stuff, and you got a CFO, he does finance stuff. So why aren't they the same people? And so one of them is going to tell you what has happened. That's your controller. And one of them should be able to tell you what's going to happen. And so that person is the person who's actually leading it, but you actually need program people to come in and to really understand where, what's driving the actual, what's driving the actual cost, how much time are they actually spending doing things, uh, you need your evaluation people to come in and say, okay, here's the impact that we're trying to make and we understand that we're going to need this amount of time, this type of dosage over that amount of time to actually hit this impact and, and to actually put a cost on that. Your board members have to be involved. They just have to be involved and you have to take the board member that's going to be the squeakiest about the financial pieces, not the one who is, who is going to be all for like this this great impact that you're gonna have, that, that naysayer that is really concerned about the financial position of the organization. Um, and so you really need to build these interdisciplinary teams. And part of that is also going to be building the capacity of those people to understand this financial information. As we're interviewing for CFOs, I want people who can understand the complex finance, financing of an organization, but can speak in language that I understand it. Because your, your program people, they're not into looking at all of the spreadsheets and spending so much time doing that. They need to understand from a very layman term what it is that we're actually talking about. And so that's how that is actually, that is how that is actually driven. So we really believe in trying to get financial information deep within the organization. We do something called game planning every year. That leads to our budget we actually give our, our organization budget to all of our staff in a, as part of what our plan is for the year so that they can match up what are our priorities, how are we spending our money. And that is, that is to be very transparent around what, we, around what it is that we do. Um, and so that everyone is, is thinking about it because no mission, no margin, no margin, no mission. Excellent. We had one quick question also about folks requesting um, samples. These have actually been hard to find. We were looking for some um, in advance for today. As you can imagine, um, this is somewhat closely held and proprietary information for certain organizations. Um, so I would actually commend, and it's, in, it's listed, um, David LaPiana just came out with this book relatively recently um, that's all about nonprofit business models. Um, and there's actually a number of examples um, and even specific pieces short of the full sort of business model um, that are in here. So you might want to 
um, take a look at this if, if you have a chance. So um, those were the questions that we had, had received by text uh, during the break. Wanted to use the last few minutes and see if there's any other questions that have surfaced from the floor. I think we have folks with microphones. So if there's anybody out there who wants to, to add to the dialogue and ask a question and keep us going, I would encourage you to do so now. Yes, we'll make we'll make the slides available. On the website with the video. Yes, on the website with the video. Uh, my name is Lisa Van Dusen with SV2, and I'm interested in. Um, I come from the private sector, and I'm interested in um, revenue sources <coughs> that are more um, fee for service oriented rather than sources of revenue that are. I mean, you've talked a little bit about that with government, but not just new sources of. Uh, donation money, but really, really business models in the sense of somebody paying for a service so that, that you've seen that are innovative and effective. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't seen a lot of those. Um, I, I can, I mean, I, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Red F, but I think in their portfolio, there are a number of organizations that are operating more like businesses. Um, if that's what you're getting at, um, and have more of an earned revenue stream as opposed to just donations and kind of contributions. Is, is that, I'm not sure if that's getting. I'm getting at is, um, looking at that split, right? You've got 80% one thing, 20% another. How can you be creative with with the supplementary components of revenue? Um, you know, how can you shift that mix, and, and are there uh, new ways of looking at how you might So, you know, this is uh, at organizations that I've worked at and, and at the organization that I lead now, this is often uh, something that comes up. And what you, uh, what you really have to be careful at is to make sure that you do two things. You, one, understand the cost of that, of that additional business revenue that you're trying to bring in. Uh, because oftentimes, I remember at one organization, it was a great idea, they thought about starting a, a, a thrift store. Uh, just to use an just to use an example, but the amount of money that it would have taken to actually operate and run the thrift store would have far exceeded the amount of revenue that it would have actually the amount of revenue that it would have actually created. Um, at first place, we've looked at, hey, we do a lot of property management of our own. What if we actually created another entity that we could actually then take contracts? to manage other people's property. But when we began to dig deep down into the financials of that, the, the, the financials didn't actually play out that it would actually be a huge gain toward, uh, toward our revenue streamline. However, it would have been a huge uh, kind of distraction <laughs> for the organization on this side. And so I've seen some organizations be able to pull it out, but I think you have to I think you have to go deep and really understand the financials before you actually make that decision. What is it going to, what is it going to, to cost you to do it? That was a great article in the Social Innovation Fund maybe in, in 2005, and it really talked about, the, the, at that time, the myth of social enterprises and the fact that the majority of your social enterprises aren't breaking even. They're still subsidizing the, the cost to provide management and all of those things to the to the young people that they are to the young people or the constituents that they're working with and oftentimes what ends up happening is that you may have a business that requires this type of person to help you run or to work in your business but your clientele are these type of people and that they don't often match up and you often can end up hiring people to come in and run your businesses because your clientele and your business and so i'm not saying don't do it I've seen some people do it and really be successful, but you have to, you have to really begin to understand the, uh, the financials of that. And I think the majority of the people who got, uh, you know, were, began to get like Ben and Jerry's franchisees very early on, the majority of those people have actually sold those, fran have actually sold those franchise license because it didn't play out in the way that they thought it was gonna be. Can be done, but you gotta know the financials around it. 
uh, before you actually do it. And actually, sorry, I, I did actually just think of an example as Sam was talking. The organization I mentioned earlier um, that had a national network where they weren't getting as much money for growth um, and they had to figure out how to sustain their existing sites. One of their challenges is they don't have a lot of unrestricted funding. And so one of the things they're doing is actually doing more consulting work. Um, they're leveraging the knowledge they have about how to work intensively with a certain population of um, sort of overage, undercredited kids, um, which they've been doing for many years. And um, they're able to work with, um, and their program takes place in community colleges, so they've been doing some consulting to community colleges. Now again, they have to be very careful that those consulting projects, that these are going to cover the costs. But um, they've actually been um, successful be starting to begin to build a bit of an earned revenue stream that's going to help them get some unrestricted money. It's probably not going to be you know, the big funder of their entire organization over time, but it's, if they can grow it a little bit more, it'll give them just enough of that kind of flexibility that they need to um, have some kind of unrestricted funding. So I mean, they're at a place where you know, there were heavily concentrated foundation funding. They're trying to diversify a little bit. Um, and you know we'll see kind of how that plays out. It's very aligned with their mission because of the, the kids that they're serving and their desire also to improve the um, high school graduation and community college and college graduation rates. So conscious of time, I want to get in at least another question. So Sam, you were really forthright in giving your example around um, how outcomes cost. Pretty eloquently just put it out there. So my question would be, in terms of your business model, how did you sell your board to understand that? Because I, I find a real competing myth around the, the overhead cost. And there's this whole focus around what, what you're, as a nonprofit, spending on overhead. And funders, as you gave example with Irvine, 50-50, there's a lot of, their, if you're over 80% funded by government contracts. So it limits. Um, often organizations that are serving really the the um, mo the bulk by governmental contracts or really low income um, population. So I'm I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit of how you brought your board to saying our outcomes need to be better and we're going to have to spend more money to to get to to that. It was um, it was just what you just said. Is that you know people I think join your boards because. You are you're having a, an impact, and they want to have an impact on the on the population that you're serving. And so, for us, working with young people transitioning out of foster care, when we would talk about what it is, we would call them our kids, uh, and when we'd say what it is that we want for them, we would say safe, affordable housing. Well, if you talk to me about my kids or probably anybody else's kid in here, when you say, hey, what do you want your kid? to do and achieve, the last thing that's gonna come out of your mouth is safe, affordable housing. That's kinda like a given, right? And so going back to what is the actual value proposition, what is the mission of the organization, and, and, really, starting, and really starting with that, and then being able to articulate um, what the actual outcome is going to be, but then quickly going back to what is your, what is your strategy to pay for this, to fundraise for this, Will it, uh, for lack of a better word, will it sell? You know, can you actually get the government revenue? Can you create an earned income, uh, an earned income source to actually do it? You know, hook them as, as we do most of our board members and most of our donors, hook them with the heart and then take them straight to what is the, what are the tangible things that you're gonna do? And I won't say it was, a, I won't say it was an easy sell, but one of the things that we had to get really clear on for us is that housing wasn't an outcome. And I had a board full of housing developers. And I was telling them housing isn't an outcome. It's a vehicle to get to an outcome. That was a very tough and hard conversation uh, to have. Um, the other thing that I will say is that when you go through this and you're going through your theory of change, you may actually decide that there's some programs that you have that aren't actually contributing to that, to that corporate outcome that you want to have. And then you may have to make the tough decision to let that program go and reallocate those resources to something that does. And so it may not always be, a, be just this big gain on top, but you, and that may, be an even, that may be an even tougher decision. We had a legacy program. We called it a legacy program because the board didn't want to let it go. Well, that legacy, now all of them are gone. So I can let that legacy go <laughs> the, the next time I'm in because it, really it really doesn't fit, but you got to know when to fight 
when to fold them and, and when to wait another day. So I'm conscious of time. I definitely want to um, thank both Jahan and Sam for their uh, participation today and sharing so much great insight and, and depth of knowledge around this. So if we can give them a hand. I think if we're lucky, they may stay around for a minute or two and be caught by people on their way out. So um, we also would actually like to collect feedback from you about the session today. Um, this is the second session in our series, and we're going to continue to learn how to do these uh, better and better and, and really try and suit the needs that you all have as participants. So I'd appreciate you giving us some feedback again through um, the polling. We're not going to, I think, project the results, but um, appreciate um, can, <laughs> candid feedback.